You've uh, so graciously joined us today, and I, I thank you so much for taking the time to do so. Not everyone here at, at Hillside Christian Church knows who you are. So if you would, please give us really just a, a snapshot of, of who you are, your ministry, your scholarship, and maybe some other interesting attributes that you might want to share with us. Sure, I'll do my best. I'm a, I'm a native New Yorker who has uh, lived in different places, though, around in the States, uh, mostly major cities. I, I grew up in New York, ministered in Brooklyn for a short time, and um, and also in D.C. for about 17 years, and then in Minneapolis for six. My um, education, though, was I was uh, went to college because of my interest in science and math. I have an engineering degree, a chemical engineering degree from Cornell in New York. But I didn't work as a chemical engineer after school. I taught math and chemistry for a while and realized I enjoyed teaching a lot. Um, and then along the way, as I was wrestling with a call to ministry, I was encouraged to go to seminary. So I went to the Trinity Evangelical Divinity School in Deerfield, Illinois at the urging of a pastor. I didn't know anything about seminary, but I respected this guy's opinion, so I went there. And I did pretty well, and after that, that's when I went to start a church in Brooklyn, New York. That's a whole nother story. But um, after some time in New York, that's when I moved to DC, and our family had grown, four kids, and, uh, and in DC is when I worked on my, my um, uh, doctoral degree in biblical studies at the Catholic University of America. So over time, I've mostly been a pastor. You know, I, even when I was a math teacher, I was also serving that small church in Brooklyn uh, that I started. And, um, and even in my years in the pastoral ministry, even after I got the doctorate, I was teaching adjunct, but still mostly pastoring church. Um, over time, I was able to write a commentary on First Peter, a small book on what is the, called What is the Bible and How Do We Understand It? And, uh, and a book that's coming out called Might from the Margins, the, power, the Gospel's Power to Turn the Tables on Injustice. And I've got a bunch of essays and other books and things along the way. <clears throat> Excuse me, I mentioned being married and having four children. Um, there are four grown children, and we now are about to have our fourth grandchild. And, uh, and for fun, I like to... Uh, work out. I like to lift weights. Um, I ride my bicycle as much as possible and I play the saxophone and the flute. I enjoy playing woodwind instruments. So that's a little quick snapshot of who I am. <laughs> nice, nice. I just want to say I, I do have a couple of your books here. Oh, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, if anyone man. at the church wants to, to borrow those or take a look at those, I, I highly recommend them. Oh, I appreciate that. I do that. not have uh, the state of uh, New Testament studies yet. I know you have a, a, a edition in there. That's uh, right. I have in there. And that's a, that's a handy book just to have when you're looking for a, a good understanding of some of the topics in New Testament. So that's great. Oh, yeah. Appreciate I'm, that. I'm waiting to get that one. I'm, that's cool. on the top of my wish list. All right. <laughs> nice. Uh, so obviously, Dr. Edwards, I'm a, a huge fan of yours and uh, your ministry, uh, your books, the articles you've written. I've really uh, grown from a lot of those. And and just um, from what I've read and your, your life experience and your, and your ministry, it's really a, a major reason that I wanted to talk with you. Uh, but another reason um, is because uh, you're, you're black and I'm, I'm, I'm white, obviously, and I'm a young pastor and I have a lot to learn. And um, I've, mm -hmm. I've looked semi-recently just kind of at where I've drawn my influences from and who I've learned from and, and noticed it's not very diverse. Um, yeah. it, it's, it's just been kind of white males. And I've noticed just on my bookshelves uh, that issue. And I want to start off by saying, obviously, uh, that's a problem. And um, I grew up in essentially an all-white school in, in, the, in the middle of Ohio uh, with all-white friends, essentially in an all-white church. And I've had really limited interaction with, with people of color really my, my entire life. And if I'm being honest, just looking back at my education and, and, and what I was taught in school and the way history was pre presented in school, we were, we were taught about the civil rights movement. But the way it was taught, it was almost like it happened and, it, and it's over with and good came from that, but, but now it, it's over. And uh, essentially, if, if there's any inequality there, it's, it's, it's your fault, so to say, uh, for not, for not uh, I, I guess, living up to whatever expectations uh, 
culture might put on you in society. And I've realized, especially even, even more lately, uh, that's just untrue. Mm. Uh, white privilege is a very real reality. And, and I have so much to learn uh, because of that. And, and one of my goals in talking to you is simply to listen to you. Mm. And I, I listen to you in your books, but I'm, I want to listen to you today. And I want to ask you, what are some ways as, as myself as an individual, and especially as a pastor, and you've pastored so much uh, in, in your history, that I can help to do, uh, for lack of a better word, to, to lay down some of that, that privilege that I was, I guess, born into, or maybe mm -hmm. disperse that privilege to others? I really don't know how to word uh, th this question yeah. correctly, so forgive me for any ignorance that might be coming across, but what can I, what can I do? as an individual and as a pastor to yeah. help disperse some of this. Hmm. Well, William, I really appreciate the, your question and the spirit behind it. And there's a lot there because in many ways, what you're describing are things that we inherit that, that's built into our culture. So the fact that you study white male theologians is not necessarily because you went searching for them, but that's mm -hmm. what you've inherited, right? Same with me. And uh, so part of the dynamic is is understanding that, that we're part of this bigger system that's been at work. Sometimes within Christianity and particularly within evangelicalism, we think it's only about my individual react, interactions, right? Mm. Um, personal salvation, personal um, decisions. And we, and that's a pretty American way of thinking because we tend to be individuals, individualistic. Yeah. So what you're getting at is this bigger, more corporate dynamic, right? to say that I'm a product of a lot of things that have been going on in the world. So I think one of the steps is what you're doing is recognizing that, that, that you're swimming in this thing. Even when we use the word privilege, it's, it's offensive to some white people I know because they think or they interpret that. I don't know what people think, but they've interpreted it to mean that doors automatically open for them and, and they will quickly tell you how hard their life has been. I mean, what the privilege means is to say, however hard your life has been, it hasn't also had to deal with racism. So, so the, the, I, the notion is that for some of us who've also had a hard life, we also have had this burden of trying to figure out when things don't go well, is it also about who I am? Why am I treated you know, these, these ways? Um, so I think the first response is what you're doing. You're, you're, assessing where you are in the grand scheme of things and you're opening your heart to listen and receive that to me is fundamentally the right perspective i would also say and i, I know you you have a uh, you may we may get to this again later but there's there's a posture of 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 uh placing oneself in that position of learning over the long haul so we're in this funny moment right now, right? And I'm seeing a lot of self-flagellation on Facebook, people just saying, oh, it's horrible and that kind of stuff. And, and we might get through this moment with some people being sad and angry and frustrated. And then, we, then we'll start to level out a little bit and people will realize, oh, it means more change. <laughs> I'll give you a quick anecdote. I was hired at a church uh, back in uh, the 90s after I left the church planting experience and I got hired at a, at a church that was predominantly white, but it was in Washington, D.C. And, and I was naive enough to think that the church meant what it was saying in terms of wanting to be more diverse and include people in the city and minister cross-section of people. And, it, and I'll just be straight. They didn't really mean that, at least not in the leadership. A lot of people in the pews wanted that. But as soon, you know, but as, soon as you say, well, maybe we could do something differently Maybe we could expand the way we worship on Sundays uh, or our gathering time. Maybe we could expand the way we think about things. No, what they meant was we want to do things just the way we've been doing it, but black people can come and maybe join in that as long as mm. they do things exactly the same way we've been doing it, right? Yeah. That story is commonplace among yep. my African-American friends, my age and even younger, who realize that they say, you say you want us, but you don't really want to change anything. So part of the reality is to say, you know, if, if I am going to learn something from others, maybe I honestly, really, truly should practice what it means to receive that teaching from someone else and actually put myself in a place where 
I don't always get my way. Mm. And uh, so that's part of it, right? I, I, and there's many layers to this, William. So I don't want to uh, oversimplify, but that's, sure. that's the basic, basic posture that I think is helpful. Yeah. That's good. That's good. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Well, personally, I must say, um, I loved your commentary on, on First Peter and the Story of God commentary series. Thank you. And obviously, one of the major topics of, of that letter, just in and of itself, which you address so well, is the topic of, of suffering. Mm -hmm. And uh, tragically, uh, recently, we have witnessed some incredible suffering mm -hmm. on the news and uh, the deaths of Ahmaud Arbery and uh, George Floyd and, and many others. And these acts of injustice, well, while they're right in our face and they're fresh and they're new, uh, are not new in, in a sense, mm -hmm. injustice and suffering. And and these, these murders have specifically sparked outrage and, and protest, and, and understandably. What is different, in your opinion, about these recent events, or even the climate of our culture right now, that might make this really an opportunity for change to occur in our culture and, and change to occur in, in our churches? That's a great question. And... Um... And I think a lot of us are thinking that way, right? Like, like I was just saying earlier, hopefully it won't be like we get back to a little leveling off and then we forget, right? Yeah. I think there are a couple of things, though. Um, one is, I, I do want to express a hopefulness. For me, it's been in the multi-generational and the multi-ethnic um, makeup of the protests. Um, I, I used to feel, and I'm... I'm at an age where I can remember a lot of outrage coming from African Americans and it being dismissed by white people, um, whether that was among Christians or even in the broader culture. Now I'm actually, and, and, and uh, Al Sharpton brought this up at the, at the memorial service for George Floyd, the one in Minneapolis. He said straight out that he was even more hopeful because he saw how all these different uh, groups of people and it's and it's been worldwide almost you know I mean so yeah. for me that's hopeful because it says that a lot of people are outraged at this moment and their outrage is is there it's causing them to join together that's that's new for me but I think the other thing that I I reserve a little bit of hope I mean a little bit of concern um, in that while we are outraged at the clear violation of, of George Floyd's rights and his outright murder. We, we are outraged by it. I'm not sure we're, we're clear that there are a bunch of things that conspired for that to happen. Um, and it's not just the bad apples, right? There's a yeah. something that, a, a, a system, like I mentioned earlier. The one piece that I mentioned in my Christianity Today piece that often doesn't get mentioned in these discussions because Ahmaud Arbery was killed uh, George Floyd was killed, but so was Breonna Taylor. That yeah. folks broke into her house. I mean, cops came into her house and killed her in her own home. Yeah. There's something that allows us to think that's okay. And then the one that's really creepy to me was this Mr. Cooper doing the bird watching in Central Park, and a and a Ms. Cooper, a white Cooper, and a black Cooper. You you have her threatening to call the police because she knows. Yeah. And she says on the phone, it, it, it'll be you know an African American man. She's She's ready to tell the police he's a black man and, and sick the police on him, mm. like instead of sicking her dog on him. That's the part that really I want to get at because it's not just that the cops were doing something, it's that, that we have a mindset in our society where we know that if we can, we can, we can, that, that black people can, will be suspect in this interchange and she is more likely to be believed. Mm. But the hope I have is there were a lot of people who were outraged when they saw that video. Yeah. And so I do have a little bit of hope that, that there'll be um, uh, a movement here um, because of the multi-generational, as I mentioned, and multicultural aspect of this. That's good. Mm -hmm. In your uh, recent article that you mentioned in Christianity Today, I'm just going to read a quote and then sure. ask a question. You said, quote, the videos have helped some white people to see a bit of what many black and brown people know. White America has, had, has long had its knee on our necks. And I'm sure that some who just read that sentence are saying, not all of white America, but that's the problem. It's hard for people of color to feel that white America is with us and not against us. White America has not demonstrated the collective resolve to repent, rebuke, and reorient itself against racial injustice. 
That includes Christians. White Christians can opt out of outrage over racial injustice. The status quo works for them, end quote. What are some of maybe uh, rubber hitting the road type of, of ways that mm-hmm. white America can, can, can repent, can rebuke, and, and can do things like reorient ourselves against racial injustice? Yeah. Thank you, William. Yeah. And uh, that is funny. That quote has been the one that's gotten a lot of my Christian friends most attention there. So, okay. um, <laughs> and part of it is, I mean, I, and I, and I tend to be a pretty easygoing guy, but I have Christian friends who've been trying to communicate with their congregations during this pandemic, right? So trying to find creative ways to do that, texts and videos and such like that. And I respect you all who are trying to do that. But, and I'm somehow on somebody's list. It's not even the church I go to, but I get these regular texts. And when we had all this stuff going on in our country, he never once addressed it, right? I mean, it was like, it was, mm-hmm. wasn't something he needed to bring up with his congregation for whatever reason. I still get the text and he still hasn't done it. And uh, so that's what I mean by opt out. It's sort okay. of like, it's a non-issue for him. And maybe even if you press him a bit, he'll recognize that, well, there's no black people in my congregation. So, you know, mm-hmm. and I've had that kind of thinking a lot. People say, well, my church is out in the middle of, you know, such and such a community and there's hardly any people of color here. So it's almost as if out of sight, out of mind, right? I don't have to think about these things because I don't have a black neighbor. To me, right. that's the part that drives me nuts because it's as if we, we can't do the or think the right thing unless, you know, it's right there in our faces, which is why I reserve a little concern here. Yeah. Um, the rubber meeting the road is, is, is a good question because you know, it's like the Samaritan and the Good Samaritan story, right? When when Jesus questions the guy at the end of the story, he says, now, which one became a neighbor? Um, and actually, that's a good way to translate it. Which one had become neighbor to the one who fell among the thieves mm. or the one who was, you know, who's suffering? And the guy answers, well, the, 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 he doesn't even say Samaritan. He says, you know, the, the, this, he points to this, to the third guy, you know, mm-hmm. Um <laughs> But the point is, you know, you can become neighbor. You can put yourself in a place where you receive uh, uh, teaching or, or instruction. In other words, the Samaritan becomes our teacher there. The person we are not expecting to be the hero of the story is the hero of the story. But that guy who, who, who Jesus is teaching has to let the Samaritan be his teacher. He has to humble himself to the point where the, the lesson of life is coming from somebody he doesn't even like, right? Yeah. So my, my challenge back to white folks, the rubber meets the road is, is find out where in your life are you actually under the authority or the leadership of somebody in color, spiritually, economically, uh, morally. Uh, we can think about that in a variety of ways. But I know people who, white people who there's hardly any place in their lives where they have a person of color who's actually in authority over them. So I would say, find, find that. Where can you learn from somebody? And I don't just mean in a book, although the books are helpful, but I mean where you actually have to receive and be the uh, recipient of some, someone else's leadership. Yeah. Wow. That's good. Mm-hmm. That's Thank good. You. Mm-hmm. So w- with that in mind, and mm-hmm. this is kind of a, a difficult question I, I would think to to answer broadly mm-hmm. uh, what can the church do to avoid this just becoming another yeah. flash in the pan type of moment right. yeah, where right. we just we do that for a little while and, and we feel right. good about ourselves yep. and um, then it just goes back to to, to normal uh, so to yeah. say what can we yeah. do to really spark lasting change and lasting reform and, and lasting uh, reconciliation that's, that's, yeah, I mean, that's a great question. You could tell we were sort of hinting at it even along the way. I think we're both feeling like we want something to be more than a moment, right? Yeah. Um, well, for me, it has meant over the years that it's not about just writing a check one time or mm-hmm. volunteering at a, at a you know, soup kitchen or something one time. It's not taking my missionary foray into a certain world and then pulling myself out of it. It can't, it can't just be that, right? Because that, that that's not transformative. It's mm-hmm. charitable, but it's not transformative. So for me, it's meant weaving these themes into my life all the time. I mean, so as a teacher and preacher, it was 
it, it's that every sermon has some way where I try to touch on issues of justice in the, in the world, because I think that's the way we live things out. I mean, if I'm preaching on something about idolatry and we, we tend to think idols are just, you know, buying the new car or the house or something, maybe the idol is the way we've made our nation. Maybe the idol is a certain ideology. Maybe, you know, so I, so I don't want it to be about a one particular thing. I want to see the challenge. I guess I put back the preachers particularly is how do I weave these themes into my, into my messages all the time. And now people will get tired of it. Some will get mad at you. And that's, sure. that's really where the rub, you know, where the pressure comes. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, yeah. be, I'll just be honest. I, and God bless you folks who are doing your best because people will say, why do you have to keep talking about these things? And your answer is going to be because there's still issues, just like our, our, you know, our sexual appetites, our financial appetites, our, you know, consumeristic things, all of those things are part of it too, right? Mm. So yeah. I just think it gets woven into what we do. But I would also say finding ways to build relationships um, across culturally, you know, between congregations and families, because ultimately the proximity of genuine relationships starts to shape how we look at life, right? So if we, yeah. if we have friendships and, I mean, really good connection, not casual, yes, I have this black friend, but if we actually have some meaningful long-term relationships, it'll help to shape how we look at the world. So that, that's part of my hope too. Lasting change comes through the formation of, of new communities of people who are, uh, who are uh, different in a variety of ways who are sharing to, uh, life together in some way. Yeah. Hmm. That's good. Yeah. Is there anything else that you, know, you can think of maybe we haven't touched on that, that the <clears throat> church can do more to equip ourselves to minister against things like racism or just injustice in general, or even maybe uh, police brutality, any way that the, the church can be equipped uh, in any more form or fashion that you can, can think of? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not an expert on activism. I find myself mm -hmm. following the lead of those who are. So okay. when I was in Minneapolis and there was a police shooting of Jamar Clark, Black Lives Matter activists were out and we, a bunch of us clergy went to the, went to the rallies because the, we wanted to be, as somebody put it, chaplains to the movement. We wanted to keep our Christian witness uh, present, even if we didn't uh, join in every aspect of, of a rally or of a protest, we wanted our Christian voices present. So sometimes there's an activism, right? That's part of it. Sometimes there's a, a, an education piece, but I'm, I'm reluctant to name a particular action because my goodness, it's multifaceted, right? So some people, it's a matter of, working on a, in a local way. Some people, it's a national platform. God opens doors in different ways. Mm -hmm. But I think it's the same related to the previous question in that it's a, it's a longer term weaving into our lives um, uh, how we speak against things. Yes, social media is a platform, but social media is, is it's got its limitations, right? I mean, you can say mm -hmm. something and then people will give a snarky answer back and then next thing you know, you've got this side thing going on and you're not really <laughs> dealing with the issues, right? I mean, it's, right. It's, it's great, but it's also, you know, a problem. <laughs> so I guess what I'm saying is that there's a lot of ways to equip oneself. Um, activism is one, but there's a, lot, there's a spectrum of ways we can be involved. I mean, it could be something as simple as helping to correct bad thinking when we're sitting at a dinner table and people start race, making racist comments or, mm -hmm. or excusing the actions of people like the guys who hunted down Ahmaud Arbor. Maybe yeah. it starts there with our own ability to, to keep some folks in check and say, well, you know what, this is not the way that uh, we, could, we could look at it a different way, right? And help people sure. to see the injustice, I guess I'm getting at. That's good. You know, so. It's a start anyway. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Well, uh, to, to close, as we kind of round this out, could you, could you just maybe give us maybe a few resources yeah. uh, to maybe continue this process of learning yeah. as, a, as a church, maybe within small group context, Sunday school context, yeah. Yeah. or just that we can sprinkle into our, our daily conversations that will spark some transformation and lasting change yeah. uh, with us? Well, honestly, there are there are a lot of resources out there, and I, and as an older guy, I tend to uh, miss some of them because I'm not on social media as much as others. But there's a few people that I know, and there's some. So, for example, there's, there's some young women who have a podcast called Truth's Table, and 
and it's awesome, you know, and they discuss uh, contemporary issues, three African American women, and they are um, uh, uh, helpful in being able to guide us to some important issues. Jamar Tisby has a book out called The Color of Compromise, where he talks about Christianity's complicity in, in racial oppression over the years. It's a hard thing for people to see, but it's, he's, he's, a, he's gonna have his doctorate in, in history, I think it's in history over time, you know, pretty soon. So it's a historical work, it's an it's a, it's a, um, academic work, right? There's, um, there's a young white pastor that I know, David Swanson, and uh, he's written a book just now, it's getting a lot of attention called Rediscipling the White Church, where yeah. he is trying to handle some of these issues in a con in a, for a white context. There's a lot of resources like that. I'll shamelessly plug my own book that's coming out called Might from the Margins, as I mentioned earlier. And that book um, will be uh, out in September. And I try to do blend my pastoral and academic uh, life together to make a case for how we can be learning um, uh, lessons uh, and not just learning, but putting into practice some things that would uh, work against the injustice in our world. Yeah. That's good. So that's a few resources. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate that. Sure. Well, um, before we close, uh, could you just tell our, uh, our church maybe <clears throat> where they could find you uh, online if they want to connect with you a little bit? And Sure. Um, you know, my initials are DRE, Dennis Robert Edwards. So and I'm a reverend and a doctor, so almost everything is Rev. Dr. Dre. So I'm there at Facebook, Rev. Dr. Dre, Instagram, and Twitter, <laughs> and and an, and an, a website that'll be um, coming out pretty soon. Also, RevDrDre.com. So that'll be the easy way to find me everywhere. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> well, if you wouldn't mind, could could you close us out in, in prayer? Yes, um, I'm honored to. Let me let, let me take a moment. Lord, we give you thanks for who you are and for what you do. Lord, we, we are grateful for every new day. We're grateful for the gift of life. Lord, we're in some um, frightening times because of the pandemic. We're in some uh, tense times with these high profile killings and threatening of black people. And we're seeing a lot of agitation in society. For some people, that will make them nervous because something's going to change. For some of us, we are hopeful that things will change for the better. I pray and ask that you would, would remember in a powerful way and in, a, in, in the biblical sense of remember, where you would act on behalf of uh, this church, for Hillside Christian Church, for, for, for Pastor William here, that you would be active to help them be the, the, the light, the salt, that you've called us to be. You would strengthen them and you would surround them with love so that because it covers a multitude of sin. You say that in your word. So even if we say the wrong thing and we mean well, give us the grace to know how best to correct ourselves and correct each other because of that love that's covering over the multitude of sins and that you would bring a wholeness uh, to this community. Help them, Lord God. We pray by the power of your spirit and in the authority of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much again. I really appreciate this and uh, have a great day. Yeah, you too. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you.